All right. Welcome. Thank you, George. We will see what slash how everything happens uh, here. But as just briefly mentioned, um, to map out and to, to learn and to catalyze the work that we're um, doing from your textbook and or any active inference representations or topics, um, it would be awesome to talk about the systems analysis approach applied to cognitive systems and how we can disentangle some of the fundamental questions like the material and the informational exchange of agent environment, um, the interfacing of material um, embodiments with thought as system of interest and how we deal with these different kinds of like nestings and enclosures um, and, and any other thoughts that you have on just this kind of like systems modeling for, um, yeah. You know, and, and where should we, where should we point to and, and dive into the textbook? But yeah, where would you begin with that? Or what does that make you think? of? Well, the, um, the textbook, what I was trying to do is kind of keep it neutral in terms of, um, uh, the idea of what knowledge looks like. Uh, so the, the concept of a knowledge base that I proposed in there, and you may see it, uh, a few people have sort of recognized it. It really is an attempt to, um, to model what I think is going on in the human brain as a learner is, is um, gaining knowledge, is constructing knowledge. And um, I think eventually we're going to converge ultimately and, and start building modeling machines. <clears throat> Pardon me. It may be based on computing. Uh, digital computing, um, maybe uh, quantum computing. Uh, but basically what it's going to look like is what the brain does. And so the, you know, the idea of active uh, inference uh, providing a basis for recognizing what's already there versus something that's new, that's informational. And then on the basis of that information, starting to um, build the kinds of cognitive structures that um, are representation of uh, what the what uh, is being learned. So the, it's just it's sort of a, uh, a faith at this point that the brain is already, the, the evolution of the brain is already figured out how to uh, deal with encoding reality into a model and uh, and then using those mo that model, those models, model of the world to um, uh, be successful in in living. And what that means for us as a society, if we have a this, large-scale uh, modeling capability that's that's similar to what the brain does. Um, societally, we have the basis for uh, providing a, a long-term uh, sustained existence and uh, ultimately to be to fulfill a purpose of a sentient uh, species, if you will, in maintaining the, the planet, the, the planet. Is, so I've written about uh, <clears throat> Gaia's mind, um, you know, I've got a couple of papers out there, presentations about the, the whole idea, but basically that's kind of where I, uh, I see this going ultimately. Getting back to the book, though, the book itself is very um, 
nuts and bolts about representation of, of, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, knowledge base and capturing knowledge and so forth. <clears throat> yeah, through the process that you've got that uh, diagram. This makes me think of Mars levels of analysis in terms yeah. of like implementation algorithmic, et cetera. So it's like, okay, this is kind of a pseudocode representation or a schematic. So how do we go from this map or what, what does it look like to, to have a map like this? And then let's just say that we also had um, anatomical and neuroimaging data of the brain. What what would be the relationship or the the synergistic epistemic value of having not just this kind of abstraction, but how would you bring this abstraction to bear with a real empirical measured system? <clears throat> Where the edges reflect, uh, 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 you know, reflect different. Yeah, the part of the problem with the brain, of course, is that the the uh, participating neural circuits that um, would be included in the boundaries of any one of those circles are really spread out, right? And they come in at different. The, the, the sensory input stuff starting back at, at the uh, uh, posterior part of the brain uh, and then uh, the associative processes that, that put it all together. Uh, so knowledge base, for example, which I show is a singular, and, and really that, that map is a, is a map of the processes, not a map of the things. So uh, knowledge based is uh, what that's representing. There is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, eh, the database system that is implemented to contain knowledge as it is acquired in the human brain uh, brains in general the um, neural circuits that participate in say the encoding of knowledge are spread across the entire neocortex and and parts of the um, uh, more primitive parts of the brain. <clears throat> so there's not going to be a one-to-one -one mapping from that diagram onto brain circuits per se. Um, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> but the functions, um, the the functions that are taking place in as as say a human being's learning and i'm talking here about developmental processes such as you know what a child is learning um, i'm just finishing up uh, one of uh, ray jackendoff's books on uh, fundamentals of language and um, i'm really struck by how often he talks about these kinds of functions of language in, in how they work in language learning and language production. Uh, <laughs> pardon me, having that same modularity. Uh, as I'm as I'm going through and reading, I'm seeing just system representation after system representation, even though he doesn't use that kind of terminology, that's what he's describing. So, yeah, so it's you... just a little side note uh, going back to um, this idea of system ease or language of thought, which he talks about and, and reflects upon. Um, the um, as he's going through and and talking about, particularly in areas of semantics, uh, lexical semantics, and then phrasal semantics and so forth. But as he's going through and describing these, I'm <laughs> I'm thinking, oh yeah, that's where system ease comes in. That's where the 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 linkages of meaning from across multiple fields actually uh, uh, operates, 
So I'm envisioning this um, research program in linguistics uh, someday. Somebody's going to, it won't be me, but somebody will take a look at how to uh, bring the kind of linguistics, neurolinguistics that Jack and Duff and, and a few others uh, work on uh, together with this idea of where in the brain is the template for um, system boundary or system uh, or, or flows or things of that nature. Where do we find those? <clears throat> Mm. Oh. Awesome. I, I I have many many um directions. I'll just start with a fun with a fun direction. Okay. Um, like the insect brain, it's wonderful and transparent, totally imageable, and so on. And uh, the uh, regions are much more defined. You know, primary primary optic with the eye. Primary olfactory, getting the antennal input. And then there's like these only very, very few, very distinct centralized integratory regions with different symmetries, including a ring symmetry and a mirror symmetries. So like, I, just to put a footnote, which is like, that will be really awesome to do systems analysis on the insect brain to help understand how different it is with the mammalian architectures. That'll help uncouple like navigation or orientation from its substrate in the grid cells or like the mammalian cerebellum. It's like, oh, no, no, it's this like symmetry group or this kind of other process. And then that will open the space with like, well, then what other morphologies could be a part of that super group for navigation? And that will exp that will open up a lot. So, but just say about the insect. Then, then another just short funny comment is like English and language. We're using English now, and uh, I have one colleague, Steve, and he's looked a lot at how English has changed in the last like five hundred to a thousand years as a function of L two L two communication, as in almost all languages always were primary speakers only with each other and training children to be primary speakers. But modern English under global and mercantile constraint has actually structurally changed quite significantly in certain semantic ways that like primary language languages never had this kind of information constraint. And um, that's reflected by various like simplifications in our grammar, like the absence of a case system and certain uses of gender and all those other things like that. But it just like, very, I just think that's very fascinating and about coming into the conscious awareness of our language use internally and externally in our understanding of systems. Like there are some linguistic understandings we could have or linguistic actions we could use or speech acts we could analyze and stuff like, however you want to think about it, like that would facilitate our systems understanding better and there are some expressions that facilitate it worse that doesn't give you the oh you ought to study systems and do it rigorously that's a second question but given that as an imperative then there are certain languages that are going to do that more elegantly or more powerfully so moving the systemese agenda or awareness into the explicit rather than just the niche selected and just letting language be whatever it needs to to flow through the niche, but then cultivating an interior niche where arbitrarily, um, arbitrarily custom and therefore incommunicable understandings could be reached as well as arbitrarily communicable understandings could be reached in shared semantic frames or in shared like symbol systems. Like I'm only going to share with you chess moves, but then we could share a ton of information about a chess game. 
And then conversely would be like, I've developed this like internal story universe that, that, you know, and then the sounds won't even make sense to somebody, but it could, it could mean everything to the person who's thinking it. Now, now to bring it to the empirical in the brain, um, here's 2021 um, uh, active inference paper. So this, when you said like that, these are functional, I mean, clearly they're functional descriptors. And um, like you said, the um, participating uh, neural components are distributed and dynamic. And that is a lot like in um, Gerdel Escher Bach with like the transient assembly of ant task groups. And then he compares that to like the transient assembly of neural activation patterns. They're just more spatially fixed, but they have this like temporally dynamical coupled nature. So in this paper, um, they, um, I mean, so then you mentioned flow, so maybe we, we'll return to flow, but basically what's, what's um, sought after from the physics of um, cognitive systems or phys physics of sentience would be, if we could model the physics of the flows across the blankets in a multi-scale kind of renormalization group, like where there's this procedural um, identification of blankets. So then they, they look at real um, uh, neuroimaging data and then look at the sparsity of the conditional couplings. So instead of just, whereas like a um, activation-based analysis, you'd be making a, a, a map like this to be like, yep, this is like our statistical confidence that this increased in activation under this experimental condition. But here, the clicks that they're looking to identify have to do with the um, strengths of the coupling or like mutual information. Um, and then there's this empirical question of kind of lumping and splitting where you draw the line. So it's not like it resolves experimenter degrees of freedom, like at, at a higher degree of precision, maybe the region could be slightly smaller or at a lower degree, it would be slightly more diffuse, but it's like identifying the um, relationships that empirically do exist um, in terms of coupling of regions and like the strength of the coupling and the distance of the coupling. I think it'll be, I mean, there's, there's so much to say, but it'd be, it will be hard to move from merely an empirical description to wise action like in an ecosystem you could study like forever and the temperature and look at the birds eating the insects but then you still might not be able to predict the consequences of like a new introduction so i still think there's a mega space between any kind of um boundary identification statistical process and and kind of utilizing that knowledge, but just from the active side, that's how people are kind of approaching that question of identifying the um, transient assemblies of causal relevance amongst the neural elements in a function specific way. How about um, in just in terms of agent environment? Is there anywhere in the textbook that you do a systems analysis of um, an organism? Um, is there anything beyond the kind of... Um, obviously, you considered the organismal case in developing the structure...
sorry. Right. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I've got lots of examples. <clears throat> Chapter 11 is the agent model. And then, um, let's see. I sort of skip right to the human condition <laughs> and the, the um, uh, society as, as the system of interest. Um, although I... Mm -hmm. I can't remember where it is. So, somewhere in here, I go from from pre living uh, analysis of pre living uh, systems like uh, ribosomes and uh, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and the whole uh, protein construction business. <laughs> And then talk about cells and metabolism, but for the life of me, I'm not coming up with that. Just a few, a few pieces here. That these are some very relevant. Uh, this schema. This is kind of most paralleled, um, most simply paralleled here. Complex environment underlying causal process providing observations at time t coming in from the bottom oh okay then um we're talking about the actuator action choices at the time step that's the policy selection All right and then uh t t plus one here's t minus one t plus one here's the world transition model then you, you have experience and memory um this is i think chunked out as a function but the way it actually plays out is the updating of parameters in this model mm -hmm. uh decision model there's various decision models um that take in pi which is the policy space and then there are decision uh models you can use to select you could pick the likeliest thing you could pick the most rewarding thing that's reinforcement learning picking mm -hmm. the likeliest thing is um Bayesian mechanics, because that's what licenses the updating on the policy prior to the policy posterior for us to interpret that as part of physics. We want to be able to describe it as a path of least action. And all these things in physics like the Hamiltonian, Lagrangian and so on, whereas mm -hmm. reinforcement learning proposes this ad hoc um, decision rule, which is, well, I'll just come to evaluate which actions have which value, and then I'll select based upon higher value. Whereas an active inference, it's described in terms of what is likely to occur. So instead of asking which actions are most rewarding, given what I prefer, goal state motivations, here that preferences are actually encoded as expectations. So it's not that I'm rewarded by 37 degree body temperature. I expect 37 degree and I do likely things and I find myself doing likely things. And um, then the decision model like connects with just, it all comes together with what messages and updating then action is taken. Strong positive and strong negative means what the affect of the organism or the fitness consequences. Yeah, this is the um, uh, range of error in the uh, the difference between the current state and the the state that is uh, as you say either most expected or most rewarding, and uh, so we what the comp computational engine is doing is is determining what that uh, difference is, and then choosing or selecting the uh, actuation. So when we saw say strong positive or strong negative, that's the, uh, the distribution of uh, where we're in the center. There's zero error or, or uh, zero um, uh, zero difference between expected and actual, and uh, 
Um, so that's that's that can be a neutral or zero response in in those situations. Whereas as we go across the range, uh, departing from zero, we either have a negative response or a positive response, depending upon what the sign of the error is. Awesome. Here to connect that to one way it's in the textbook. So here's the 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 dorsal um you know the cutaway or of the spinal cord. Uh -huh. Proprioception, sensory information is coming in, and this is just a set point expectation. So if I expect my arm to be this angle, and then the way that it moves to another position is basically the ex it's expected to be there, and then action is a self-fulfilling prophe prophecy. How does the posit the set point decision such get get set such that we can calculate uh this zero point that gets set through the descending projections of cortex um and then how are the decisions selected here's um the uh dopaminergic part of the brain and there's basically two um modes of policy selection it's kind of like a scales um in a low dopamine, this is like thinking fast setting. Again, way oversimplifying, but just to show it. In the thinking fast habitual setting, the policy prior gets passed through. And so it's computationally cheap, but basically the past recent past or the extended past is just sampled from or chosen from with a simple heuristic. Whereas the thinking slow is the deliberative thought uses the expected free energy which actually reweights policies depending on their expected pragmatic and epistemic value. And so that's like the sort of decision making that actually updates to not just pragmatic and not just epistemic value, but but some blend of them. So it's like, here's the the um, thousand brains abstraction capacity of the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. um, hierarchical predictive processing, abstraction layers, et cetera, making um, connections to the embodiment motor selection, goal selection, which might also have to do with internal goal selection, internal um, foraging motivation that um, then makes it out to the kind of um, descending motor control cortical regions, which then set uh, the set point such that an autonomous, reflexive, simple differential circuitry can stabilize motor action in the kind of actual last message out to the actuator. So just like, just, we have so many points of contact and um, hence, like why I wanna build these first, links so that we can bring i mean so to know that this image is um coming from a coherent generative model that includes the rest of this textbook such that if we can make a mapping between this figure and the active inference images at the very least it it, it could then then the two um approaches could be regarding the same territory they could be um have some isomorphisms they could also eat and where they would differ they would have um unique additional perspectives and information and and same could go for all the other um general systems theories as lenses so whatever the verdict or the rubric is for like which one of these um, general systems theories, whatever their characteristics are, um, using multiple of them, worst case scenario would be redundant. Like if one theory is strictly enclosed within another theory, then applying it might not provide you any novel information. But to the extent that they even have different emphases and 
compositions and and also like visualizations then the more the better and it motivates the kind of i mean to to, to bring it back the kind of knowledge base such that the views and the modeling is a pro it's such a key link because it's easy to include some of the modeling preemptively in the knowledge base to make the semantics of the knowledge base more actionable for a limited kind of modeling, even if it's not realized as a limited kind of modeling, um, which limits the applicability of knowledge bases, which is why in practice it is often super hard to get data to work well together because there's a lot of implicit information that you don't need to consider when you're doing the comparison within the data set, but then to do a date comparison across data sets, there's all those other levels of information. Um, so it's very interesting. We've talked a lot about the rendering and the kind of XML, HTTP, et cetera. How do you go from like notation to modeling to simulation? But the kind of key enabler there, as it kind of appears now is the knowledge that the system's representation is the right, not, not saying that exact tuple, but in that direction as specified, is the right knowledge base format. Because anything less is gonna be missing systems information. Anything more Best case scenario, it's just redundant or extra information. So that's not a bad thing. But anything that's kind of like welding certain things together with a system's definition, at the very least, it's not the general system's definition. So then there's going to be some situation where whatever was like hard coded or limited in terms of the system's definition in the knowledge base format, that um, limitation failure to have the expressivity of the tuple, that limitation will come to be the limitation of that in modeling, which might be a non-issue, but it also might be the issue. This one also, oh, there's a, 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 a very funnily similar one here too. Okay. System of interest, proximate, um, multimodal, multimodal niche engagement, Pro proximal to the proximal niche, proximal to the proximal to the proximal niche. Right. Here's the hidden underlying latent phenomena of a jumping frog and then on the outside here are the um observations so this here we we kind of, i mean the, the circle part is similar but it's it's a it's even deeper than that because here's the observations as we're viewing the frog because the setting that in this behavioral um context our setting is that this inner dashed box is the cognitive model map of the rat in the maze. And then we are in the laboratory passing what for us are actions, but for the rat are observations in. And then what is its behavior are our observations because we're doing behavioral analysis. So then in that kind of um, jumping frog setting, um, the inside was the hidden event. And then the outside were the us from the outside touching the proximal or whatever level of membrane or, or interface. Whereas here, which is what makes it try. So, so that behavioral analyst approach is the view from the outside. And that's what enables us to make a linear model of any system, make an active inference model of any system, et cetera. 
here, we don't just want statistical lasering in. We want a positive constructivist description that actually enables like systems engineering. So the focus is on the system of interest. However, the very same um, interfaces and blankets and levels of causal proximity, those same boundaries are reached, but they're reached declaratively from the inside building out system of interest, layer plus one, layer plus two, et cetera, rather than investigated statistically from the outside. So it's a description descriptionist because it's it's the system's language. It's defining, it's making a positive expression about the basis of it, not just translating measurements from the outside into numbers and then just continuing with a number work. Hope that is accurate or makes sense, but that would be awesome if the case. Oh, here's Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we, we could revisit five, five something like this, but connected to this, it looks like you already have. Yeah, that was the core of my robot brain. Yeah. Okay. Another, another connection here. Um, uh, so Waddington landscape, classic epigenetic, um, representation. So here times unfolding forward, um, it could be developmental or speciation time. Um, and from similar starting points, depending on the, uh, um, landscape and the initial conditions and the kind of bifurcations or the ruggedness of the landscape, um, there are dual descriptions of the space. One of them is a, is a, a probability distribution that's smooth over these paths. And then the other is the path trajectory n equals one. So the agent-based model gives us the actual n equals one procedural constructivist view from the inside, but then the behavioral experimenter um, is looking across studies to develop the smooth envelope that describes this um, occupancy distribution. And we did this a ton with ants where like each one of these, like we were tracing the trajectory of individual ants, but then you could make heat maps like distributions across nest mates. And then similarly, like looking at task performance in the field, it's like you could look at one nest mate and see it picking up a pebble, dropping it, walking, moving, or, and, or could, um, see the broader movements of some of something that, that they were not necessarily even seeing spatially. Tom, how goes it, or what would you like to talk about? Tom? Sorry. I don't, oh okay. yeah, if you want to bring up anything or talk or anything we're just chilling for the last bit here no i would just um 
note that I read uh, David Rousseau's paper on GST, and I'm writing up some notes about it. Found it to be very interesting. Good. We're um, inching closer. I got a lot of the administrative details worked out with uh, Jen McCarr for the SIG. And uh, the steering committee has been meeting fairly regularly. Um, Tyler and uh, um, Rob are uh, away for the next couple of weeks. So we're, we're just in a kind of a holding pattern right now. I'm going to write a little blurb for the um, newsletter and we're Lynn Rasmussen and I are, are working on editing the description try to clean that up a little bit and um, then hopefully sometime into March we'll have our first open meeting where we'll be discussing that paper that paper in uh, chapter six I think it is of so if I have comments on that paper who should I send them to? Well, hold on to them for right now. Like I said, we're going to have a meeting where that's we're going to be inviting people to do exactly what you did. That is, read it, make notes, get ready for commentary. And then when we have the open meeting, it will be basically to discuss the issues. What we're trying to use that paper for, by the way, is just orientation. Uh, of all the uh, prospective members of the SIG to what the SIG is attempting to do. <clears throat> Not necessarily follow <clears throat> Rousseau et al.'s uh, exact formula, but that formula gives us a target uh, in terms of the process that, that we hope to open up in the SIG. Um, and then so we'll invite people who are who actually have actively engaged in that material, such as yourself now, uh, to uh, step up to the mic and uh, provide some critique or commentary or whatever. Um, we're not going to open it up to open discussion un unless a person has already said, OK, I've, I've, I've engaged with that material. I think I understand what they're saying and I would like to say about that. All right. That's a good idea. Yeah, because we otherwise we're going to get people saying, well, my idea is to do um, We know how that goes on our Saturday morning. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that will be March. We'll, we'll then follow that, I think, with... Um, uh, we've actually got a couple of candidate GSTs that we want to then, uh, uh, like John John Kenneman, for example. I don't know if you've read much of his stuff, uh, relational yeah. and so forth. Uh, so we'll take those and then start to apply some of the ideas that come out of this this that first meeting with regard to how do we decide if something is a general theory, how do we decide if it's applicable, uh, you know, what what are the criteria that we're looking for and all that kind of stuff. So we'll just continue that process up to the, um, up to the um, conference, have uh, a SIG, one or more SIG sessions at the conference, and then uh, continue the process uh, or maybe early fall uh, after the conference. So we've got we've got a long term plan goal that's that we formulated, and we want to really make some progress because in the end, the IEEE's <laughs> bylaws <laughs> say this is what we're supposed to do, and so <laughs> we all thought it'd be a good idea to <laughs> actually try to do it. Sounds good. Yeah. On a uh, on a personal note, I might be out of touch for a bit. I'm having a knee replacement next week. Uh, I think I'm only going to be in the hospital for one night, but uh, I'll probably be limited in getting around. I'm not sure how that's going to affect me, but 
Yeah. Hopefully it's only temporary. Yeah. Well, the woman across the street here, I'm, I'm sitting, my office has a window facing the street so I can kind of see what's going on in the neighborhood. And she just had uh, a knee replacement and she was back up and walking. I think it was just a little over a week. And then uh, with a walker. Um, so I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah, they get up quickly. They do thousands of them now. So it's known quantity. Let's see, just in our last bits, um, we submitted the small optimism grant with, so let's just go to the Shingai was the uh, lead. The team was him and Joe, who he's continuing to uh, work with as the people who are allocated the the funding, which is actually locked for one year. So it's kind of like promised upon receipt funding, which is cool. Um, and then my colleague Pablo from the Institute and I are just supporting, but we're not being funded by this grant. And uh, we separated three areas, research, development, and then communication and engagement. In each of the three areas, we had milestones. Um, each milestone, method, product, uses, and advantages. One interesting thing was like, the application process was was like here's a bunch of form templates like pick whichever form template you want to use but then elsewhere there was information saying that the grant should convey this information so then that was we were figuring out how to just it's just kind of like it's like writing your own grant format in some some interesting ways and that was basically it but we just did other stuff that we didn't include here so on the research side, do the systems analysis um, on the OP stack, just like we had described, and document and pursue uh, the analysis method and just seek to make the, the, the process funded and supported to like be what it can be. Uh, and the benefits to the system of interest are the, uh, among various things we can say basically the value proposition is people are making all kinds of proposals across layers of the stack all the time. Like we should do, you know, three out of five or three out of seven, or we should have this size of that, or we should flip from the probabilistic game theory consensus layer into the zero knowledge cryptographic consensus type, or maybe other types. It's like, how can you really know what the consequences might even be, let alone have real time awareness without something like a systems model to understand the consequences. And if it really is as clean as these interfaces are, then defining them is going to enable more modularity and security in the system. However, if there actually are hidden dependencies across layers, like actually the governance does have some sort of influence on the data availability then it's those kinds of relationships that also need to be understood in the context of like systemness and sense making and making decisions for a system so that optimism can be coherent. And then we'll write a paper or papers on this. Realistically, we'll probably do something different than a paper that generates a paper as an output, but just made it as more of a milestone. Um, build that systems model while um, from the top down structural, which is the traditional systems engineering tokenomic modeling perspective, structural from the top, and then also integrate that with the active inference, cognitive modeling, agent-based perspectives um, on, on those different nested layers or stacked layers and have that be 
rendered in SysXML and then executed in CAD CAD active block fronts. And then meanwhile, just uh, have some of our meetings openly as basically they actually all are and just see where we get. But it was awesome to get to something short and clear and we just hope that we conveyed how it's relevant to them first and then I think it'll just be interesting to see how yeah so if we get it good if not we could um try to have philanthropy support it or if we just continue working on it other ways or however Sorry, I keep muting myself for coughing. Uh, the Active Inference Institute is a 501c, right? Pending, like we submitted the form 1023, but it hasn't come through. So oh, technically, okay. donations received would be like allegedly retroactively tax exempt, but I kind of don't want to engage in retroactive yeah. uh, promising. So I'm waiting until we have it. But meanwhile, until we hear back, that we like do or don't. I'm thinking about how those kinds of philanthropic systems could be so that yeah. we can like make things happen during this year because outside of the crypto grant, which is kind of a rapid grant format, um, any kind of traditional grant, we wouldn't even necessarily hear back until like next year. So hence motivating industry partnerships and kind of large and small private philanthropy directions so that we can get going tomorrow rather than possibly in the future. I had met with uh, um, Shanghai and, and Joseph on the, uh, and, and one of the subjects was about the funding. Uh, so I'm excited to see this grant proposal. But one of the things I suggested to them was that, that um, in order to really get into, say, uh, um, philanthropic uh, foundational grants and things like that, that they would need to consider something like a, a 501c um, an official organization, because uh, almost any funding formal funding methods going to require there be an organization to point at um, with, you know. Yeah. The oh, IEEE isn't going to take it on, but. Well, know. I guess the good news is in the short term, the Institute can. And um, there's also fiscal sponsorship with if, if that is required or just for, um, it will be awesome to see can, can early and transient support be provided to a project like this to to give them space to like grow and develop and everything um so yeah it's going to be fun any um last comments or thoughts <clears throat> i'm good Tom, anything other than good luck with your healing? I uh, know. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, try to be on time next time. Um, it's all good. Yes, let's see. Next time, March first, a new month begins. Okay, it's coming. <laughs> see you soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.